Harold James from Princeton University. Uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, really very happy to be here. And I think we've actually got the order of the themes to think of the day in the, in the right order. It seems to me that this political union issue is absolutely fundamental and that what follows for the rest of the panels uh, really are particular illustrations of difficulties that arise in the, in the absence of a political union. Um, at the moment, I think many people are going back to the debates and the political discussions of the early 1990s, uh, because at that time, in the lead-up to the Maastricht Treaty, it was really widely believed that the monetary union was only part of a general process and that it needed to be accompanied uh, by a political union. And uh, it's, it's documented in many, many statements at the time. In October 1991, uh, Chancellor Kohl told uh, ecstatically cheering Bundestag that what Germany needed and what Europe needed uh, was the political union to go alongside uh, the economic union. But the problem was that at Maastricht, the economic and monetary union, the EMU, was being prepared in enormous detail, uh, but there was absolutely no thought really to the uh, discussion of the political union. And this has led to the accusation uh, that the policymakers at the time behaved uh, irresponsibly and uh, didn't really take account of the uh, logic uh, of the process. Um, it's, it's exemplified, uh, there's a very, very fine, enormous biography of Helmut Kohl published by the German historian and political scientist Hans-Peter Schwarz that makes exactly this point, but uh, uh, Ottmar Rissing, the former chief economist of the IMF, makes, makes exactly the same point in a number of very influential newspaper articles that the uh, monetary union uh, was ill-prepared in the early 1990s. <coughs> And it seems to be borne out by the experience of the last three or four years uh, that on the one hand uh, there's an institution that's very successful in delivering short-term defenses of the, of, of the currency, of the euro, um, but any attempt to map out a longer-term plan seems to be doomed uh, to, to failure, that there's no consensus on this. But everybody is thinking about this, this long-term plan. Um, there's a widespread discussion, for instance, of whether the events of the early Republic of 1790 and Hamilton's assumption of the debt of the individual states arising out of the War of Independence uh, should be a model uh, for, for Europe. Um, Thomas Sargent made this the key point of his Nobel Prize acceptance speech. Um, I like to make the joke that if there's a redesign of the Euro banknotes, um, they should put Alexander Hamilton on the Euro banknotes as well. Um, but but this is this is taken up um, uh, the successive presidents of the ECB have made the point. Um, uh, Jean. Claude Trichet, when he accepted the Charlemagne Prize in Aachen, uh, said in a long-term historical perspective, Europe, which has invented the concept and the word of democracy, is called to complete the design of what it already calls a union. And Mario Draghi is much more explicit than that. It, it goes really uh, very far in this direction, uh, demanding the collective commitment of all governments to reform the governance of the euro area. This means completing economic and monetary union along four key pillars. One, a financial union with a single supervisor at its heart to reunify the banking system. Two, a fiscal union. Three, an economic union. Four, a political union where the exercise of shared sovereignty is rooted in political legitimacy. But the problem is electorates are really unwilling to accept this. And this longer term vision um, looks as if it's nothing more than a chimera that covers up 
the effective short-term action and in the long run this is a kind of mixture um, that seems to be uh, unsustainable. Um, I, I think and uh, Jerry was really uh, stating this as well in his final comments, um, that the events of the last three or four years have really moved us further away rather than nearer uh, to getting a long-term political union because of the things that we think of as necessary uh, for a political union a consensus about how democracy uh, operates, um, a sense of how redistributive mechanisms work, um, a sense of the security environment of the, uh, the, the nascent country. Um, all of these look more problematical now than they looked in 2008 or 2010. Um, democracy. Um, there's a a bon mot that uh, Jean-Claude Juncker uh, had that um, we all know how to do the right thing, but what we don't know is how to get re-elected after doing the right thing. Um, Mario Monti um, almost verbally, explicitly echoed uh, that phrase when he was commenting on his spectacular and humiliating uh, defeat in the elections of February. Um, that this year um, there's no knowledge of how to get the democratic consent uh, for policies that need to be applied um, so th th that looks as if it's a long-term uh, uh, problem that uh, is uh, confronting the the Europeans um, but there's something that, that has made this much, much worse. I, I, I think the uh, financial crisis has brought up a discussion about the distribution of income and particularly the distribution of wealth um, that is more and more polarizing and more and more poisoning uh, political discussion. And uh, it's been revived in a spectacular way after the ECB study on uh, wealth in Europe was anticipated a few weeks ago by the Bundesbank, which published part of the results of this survey, um, with the apparent sign, uh, the apparent result, uh, that the mean and median wealth of German households was considerably less than the wealth of households in southern European countries uh, that were in the grip of the financial crisis. And there are all kinds of flaws in the study. I mean, I think uh, we'll probably have some, some discussion of this study because it is a, a fundamental I issue. There are questions about when the data was taken because uh, the wealth of the Mediterranean households reflects considerable investment in real estate and property that probably priced at an earlier stage in the financial crisis so it looks as if it's uh, more inflated than than it should be um but the, f the very fact of this study and the fact of its political reception in germany indicates the way in which there's a kind of polarization um of europe on issues of of, of wealth um that makes it very very difficult uh, to construct a working uh, political union. And I think the, the Cyprus crisis has brought in a new element, um, which is the uh, kind of geopolitical issue in the long debate about whether there would be a, a Russian intervention or the terms on which there would be a Russian intervention, or even since there hasn't been an intervention, a discussion whether Russia in the future uh, might benefit from the crisis uh, in Cyprus. And those, those mixtures of um, failures of democracy, politicized discussions of wealth distribution, politicized discussions of security issues, those all seem to call back the worst ghosts of the 20th century for Europe, of the early years of the 20th century. And it's really not a surprise that many people are now thinking again about a Europe that's divided and at risk of 
fighting itself. Uh, so again, uh, to quote uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, who seems to be filled with a unique degree of pessimism at the moment, um, Jean-Claude Juncker is looking back to an event that we're almost at the 100th anniversary of. We're almost at the 100th anniversary of 1914. And before 1914, many people had convinced themselves that Germany and France were so clearly integrated economically uh, that they, there was no real rationale for them to go to war with each other. But by 1914, um, this war uh, broke out. So it, it does seem to me that after several years of a financial crisis that doesn't go away and that seems to get worse and worse, uh, we're actually in a poorer position to talk about political union than the makers of the Maastricht Treaty would have been in the early 1990s. And so the question about political union um, looks a bit like the old joke of a foreigner who is lost in a town and asks for um, the, the best way to get to the town hall. And uh, the person who replies then says, well, you know, if, candidly, if I were you, I wouldn't start from this point. And uh, we're exactly at that moment that uh, it would be nice to get to uh, the town hall. It would be nice to get to political union. But it's really hard uh, to start from uh, that point. Um, uh, why? Um, I mean, some kind of just crude overview of how political unions meshed with economic unions and monetary unions in the past, I think is very helpful here, because it does appear as if everything is just taking place in the wrong order. If you think of the United States, uh, the 1790 assumption was really only possible because the United States had already constitutionalized itself in 1787. Uh, if, if, if it had taken place in the, the other order, um, I think the mutualization of debt in 1790 would have been so controversial um, uh, that it would have uh, really destroyed the imminent uh, union. Um, that's also... Uh, the story, if you go to, to Europe, um, for what happened in the uh, 1870s, uh, that Germany was united politically on the 18th of January 1871. In 1873, after two years of political union, um, they agreed to a common currency. They merged the Thaler and the Golden currency and created a new currency, the Mark. Um, and two years after that, in 1875, they agreed on a central bank. And the Europeans have done this in exactly the same, the, the, exactly the opposite direction, that they first of all created the central bank. Um, then after that, they created the common <coughs> money. And at some point... Um, in some indeterminate future, uh, there's the debate about political union. Um, but those historical reflections also, I think, conjure up something that is uh, terribly uh, problematical in that these successful unions, these successful political unions, whether it's the United States or Germany or many other creations of a single state, if you think of Italy in the 19th century, they're the creations of war. And the easiest and obvious way of creating political unions is out of war. Um, and this is exactly what we really don't want. Uh, so how can we create a state, uh, a unified state, without war? That may be where it's fortunate uh, that this uh, whole day is under the auspices of uh, the... Uh, some kind of Austrian patronage, um, uh, because uh, Austria was often in the Ancien Regime presented as an alternative to the warlike expansion of states. Um, other countries go to war. You, happy Austria, marry. To Felix Austria Nubes uh, was the slogan of the Habsburgs, that they went in for dynastic marriages uh, rather than for military conquest. And so uh, to some extent, this was an alternative model. France was about expansion by war, and Austria was about expansion uh, by, uh, by marriage. And um, um, 
this this idea um, that the uh, European Union is is a kind of marriage contract actually appears very very often in the in the discussion. Um, uh, Jacques Delors in the 1980s, uh, when he was commission president, was already raising the issue of a two-speed Europe in which there might be a different kind of marriage contract. Um, and recently in the crisis of the euro, um, Martin Wolf has been repeatedly going back to this theme uh, that Europe is just held together because the cost of failure or the cost of divorce is is uh, too high. Um, in the middle of the 1990s, the French finance minister um, had a nice uh, phrase that this should really be Europe's affair on its own. Um, uh, the French finance minister in 1997 said, people who are married do not want others in the bedroom. That was uh, Dominique Strauss-Kahn, um, <laughs> who had uh, this, this, uh, this nice, nice line about how marriage should be something that others, and he meant in particular the United States, shouldn't really uh, be interfering with. Um, uh, so um, what is it that you need to do in order to get this kind of union that's not... Um, constructed in the traditional way by war, but is constructed out of consent, uh, out, of, out of a kind of thing that's analogous to a marriage, um, to actually work. In the memorandum, um, I suggested uh, three ways of trying to get something that's more flexible than the existing structure as a way of uh, building a long-term durability of the uh, monetary and political union. Um, starting from the most technical and going to the most ambitious, uh, they're the following. Um, when we look back at the origins of the crisis, the one-size-fits-all monetary policy was clearly something that exacerbated rather than overcoming regional differences. And monetary policy needs to be more flexible to deal with regional booms and busts. Um, there's a widespread acknowledgement, I think, of this already in that um, you can think of, for instance, different collateral requirements um, in different regions uh, of, of the country in order to deal with potential future asset uh, booms. Um, but more radically, though, um, I had a discussion in the, in the short memorandum of whether parallel currencies are not a suitable way of giving more flexibility, uh, more flexibility for adjustment um, in the uh, case of at least uh, some members of the monetary union. And that was really informed not just by recent history, but uh, by a long history. If you think of very, very long established successful uh, monetary systems of uh, early modern uh, Florence or the Netherlands in the early modern period, um, these are systems that had two monies, a gold and a silver uh, e currency that fluctuated against each other and through their fluctuations, allow for a greater degree of uh, flexibility that tr characteristically the important international payments are made in gold-based currencies and wages are paid in a silver denomination. Um, is it possible to think of something like this? Um, well, there were historically these plans in the early 1990s. The British Treasury produced um, the so-called hard ecu plan um, that has has an echo of this. Um, and you can think of this, I think, as giving a kind of let out uh, for countries that find the uh, the difficulties of the of the monetary union um, too great. And then thirdly, in the memorandum, I have a discussion of uh, what kind of transfers are needed. And this seems to me to be absolutely central to the, the, the future of the discussion, because um, if transfers are going to take place 
from one country to another if it's going to be always a discussion of what the transfers are from Germany to Italy or Greece or Spain or from Finland to Greece or from Slovakia to Greece, uh, you will get inevitably enormously politicized and enormously controversial um, discussions. Um, and people will say, why should we pay? The Slovakians were already saying this a long, long time ago. Um, why should we pay to help Greece when Greece is clearly so much better off than uh, Slovakia is? Um, but if transfers take place, not from country to country, but from individuals to individuals through a social security system, um, they're deprived of that kind of political and politicized uh, content, and they appear to be mus much more just um, and to correspond, in other words, with a fundamental uh, a human sense of what justice is, rather than of what a political process is that's needed to hold a tottering unit uh, to, together. Um, I think you can think of this very much also in terms of the US contest, uh, context. If we had big formal transfers from New York or New Jersey to California, uh, people would really get upset about that. But we don't get upset because they take place uh, through the tax system, but above all through the social security system. And so in the longer run, um, making Europe, completing the European Union seems to me to demand the Europeanization of the social security system. Only this is really unbelievably difficult. If you think of the experience of Italy, Italy with a very, very strong regional difference in, in wealth and income, um, only very, very recently introduced a common social security system precisely because of the differences of regional inequality. So it's a difficult project to accomplish, um, but it's one that seems to me potentially much much more in accordance with basic human demands for justice uh, than the idea of transfers from one state to another that can be only motivated um, by a sense of needing to do something in an emergency to keep a fragile union together. And that's really not a good way of guaranteeing the survival of a political system. Um, in fact, we have analogies of this too from the past of Europe, from the European past, um, countries that just believe themselves to be put together by economic logic were subject to incredible strains and incredible tensions. Um, it's part, I think, of the tragedy, for instance, of German unification in the 19th century, uh, that the Germans weren't really convinced that they belonged together because they were a real unit, but they were convinced that they belonged together because that was economically desirable in an era of the railroad and of uh, national economic integration. The um, German liberal journalist and thinker who offers a kind of blueprint of political unification in the 1860s, Ludwig August Rochau, um, had a very telling phrase. He said, union for us is not a matter of the heart. Um, it's become purely a matter of business calculation. And when you have that matter of business calculation, you set yourself up for the possibility of tremendous reversals and a constant discussion of how what you're doing is not living up to the true ideal. There was a kind of German ideal that the state of 1871 never matched up to. And in the same way, it seems to me that there's a European ideal that the European Union is at the moment moving further and further away from. And in thus in this, in this sense, building a explosive mixture uh, that can and may destroy it in the future. Thank you.